In this video, we're going to be showing you how to troubleshoot like a diesel mechanic, why you should not trust your multimeter, and also a destruction of the week. Hey guys, beautiful snowy day here. As you can see, snow is coming down. And I'm working on a school bus here. And I've never worked on one of these before. Well, I've worked on plenty of buses, but this is a Webasto or Webisto. Not sure how to pronounce that appropriately. Uh, diesel fired heater for the cooling system. It helps heat the engine coolant, which is pumped through the cab of the bus to heat the uh, quarters where the students and driver are. It also helps keep the engine temperature up. This one's not turning on. Um, now remember I haven't worked on these before but I'm a pretty good electrical troubleshooter and this one is not kicking on so um, luckily Webasto shout out to them they actually have a wiring diagram and full owners and operation manual on their website uh, which you can just log in for free and they've got these fuses here the, none of them have power they don't appear to be blown um, I want to make this video because I'm gonna be troubleshooting it but not only that I want to show you that your multimeter can lie to you okay so we're gonna be talking about what I mean by your multimeter can lie to you. So this is what Webasto uses for all their inputs into this heater. It's a nine pin connector, that, the same one that Cat uses for the Com adapters. It's a Deutsch style. And it's got two parts, two grounds. These are constant. It's also got other wires for switched inputs to tell to turn on and turn off. Now I got my multimeter hooked up to the power in the ground and it's showing voltage, about 10.38. So we'll just say 10 and a half volts, right? So if you trust your multimeter, you'd say, okay, well, we've got a little bit less than 12 volts, but we've got voltage here. We can move on and go ahead and troubleshoot this control unit because it's getting voltage. Well, that's wrong. And I'm gonna show you why. So it's showing voltage, right? But if you put any sort of load on this circuit, now this is the main supply for grounded power to the circuit. It should be able to pull a small load. Now I'm gonna hook my test light up here the test light should light up. As you can see, the test light's not lighting up, but our voltage dropped to zero. Whenever this is touched, part of ground, drops to zero. Now, what does that mean? That means this load, while it's showing voltage on our multimeter, is not able to hold a load. It's not able to pull any current, which means there's a problem, most likely corrosion, or bad fuse or something on the either the ground or possibly the probably the power side more more likely and it's some current or some voltage is able to pass through but it's not able to pull any current you should always load test your circuits use a test light or there's good tools out there like the load pro um, that you can use with your just your multimeter you don't need a test light at that point and it'll test for that the circuit can actually pull current. All right, so now our circuit is showing about eight volts, and you might be thinking well, like, well, you didn't really check the ground. Well, I did check the ground. What I did is instead of plugging into the nine pin, I went to a good, known good bolt that was clean and on the frame, and it also shows eight volts if I pull the ground off from the pin. So it's on our power side, it's not on the ground side. So. I did find the fuse. It took a little while though, so it's not up here. It's not on the battery where the wiring diagram showed. Look at that non-cat engine. Disgusting. So, in this fuse panel, there's one called the WB STO. It's this one right here, 30 amps, just like the wiring diagram shows. So, it's this one right here and it lights up so it's got good voltage going in and it's got good voltage going out remember our test would not do that so basically we know that um, now how do I know that this is the fuse that WB STO can stand for anything well you can remove the fuse and see if our voltage drops to zero that's what we're going to do. And you can see the connectors look clean there. So if it's dropped from 8, you basically know that that fuse is... Yeah, so we're at 0.4. So basically that fuse is the supply for this. 
So now we gotta figure out why it's dropping basically all its voltage between the fuse and back there on the bus. We're like, okay, well, how do you know which is your input and what's your output? Well, since we have the fuse removed, you're gonna have voltage on your input side at all times. Or you should. So that your input side's okay. So that wire, the outermost one, is gonna be your output side. Now, even though we know that it's got to have excessive resistance on the circuit, I wanted to ohm it out just so we can test it. So we've ran this little pin in here, and then I got my little wire deal here. And what do we got? 1.5 million ohms. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a bit. So, that makes me think we have resistance, just like I thought. Um, however, it's not in the fuse panel, or at least not in the fuse. It could be in that wire. Also, if you remember, this wire splits from one to two. It could be wherever that split is. There could be a butt connector in the frame rail somewhere that is extremely corroded. So, now it's on to find it. All right, so we're under our bus here. We're about not quite halfway. But what I like to do is, there's our wiring over there, is I like to pick a spot, clean spot, about midway, and see if we can find where our splice is. Remember, we've got two, two brown with a white there, but we've only got one on the fuse side. So I found this clean spot here. It's like 30 degrees here. Anyway, um, so we have a single brown with a white here. So we know now that it splits after this point further down that way. So now we can pull apart our harness here and see if we can find out where it splits. All right, so going down the frame rail, pulling this all apart, it looks like it splices from one to two with a connector eh, about two feet from the end of the plug. Now, it's possible that the wire could be damaged anywhere along here, but generally I find that anywhere there is a single to a two or anywhere there's a connector, you're gonna have a much higher likelihood of corrosion or damage, so let's see. And in general, I do not recommend piercing wires with a test light, but there's no connector to test here, and this is the highest likelihood of the spot where corrosion would be. So what we're gonna do is, as you can see, I've already done it right there, but. We're going to take our test light, and we have a known good ground, because I ran a ground all the way to the batteries, to our test light. Now, it should light if the source of the corrosion is in here. And it's not, so that means somewhere before here is the source. So, we need to trace the source of our corrosion here. Um, since the frame rail protects, protects the harness somewhat, I'm gonna start at the front, kind of. And I've pulled it back here a little bit. And sure enough, look at that. Right there. That is some corroded, nasty wiring. And it looks like something's hit at a rock or something. And to test our theory, look at that. We got voltage there. Nothing there, so we're gonna have to cut this wiring out here and then put some new in, and that should fix our problem. In this week's Destruction of the Week, we have a C7.1 in an excavator, and the 7.1 is way different than a normal C7. And it had a horrible, what sounded like a bottom end knock. And what I was doing here was checking the connecting rods to see if one was not quite, uh, we'll say tight. And, oh, that seems to be uh, quite excessive play there. Had a completely damaged crankshaft and connecting rod. So we got her all buttoned back up. And as you can hear, she is definitely running now. So, good job.